appreciate that scripture reading. We'll come back to that passage as we are involved in our study this morning. I want to encourage you to have your Bible out and be ready to follow along as we consider some points addressing the question, how can I tell if I am growing spiritually? How can I tell? It's important for parents to measure their children's physical growth. I remember when our two were very little, I remember taking them to the pediatrician, and there they would have their weight taken, their height, the circumference of their head would be taken, and that would be put on a growth chart. And that would be compared to other infants their age, and and we would hear how they rate with others their age. These growth charts can give parents some assurance. Yes, everything is going fine with the development of my young child. Or they could also detect and provide an early warning that your child has some underlying medical issues that need to be taken seriously, need to be addressed. We understand the importance of that for our physical health and for the development and growth of our children. I want to make a spiritual application of that this morning. Regardless of how old a person is when they're saved, all Christians start out as babes in Christ. As our Lord told Nicodemus when he came to him at night, that one must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom. John chapter 3 and at verse 3. And as a newborn babe in Christ, regardless of the physical age, that new Christian is expected to grow. 1 Peter chapter 2 and at verse 2, that we are to hunger for the Word, that we may grow thereby. And as Peter ends his second epistle, that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know that God expects us to grow. We know that God has given us everything that we need to grow. How can I know that I'm growing? How can I know that I'm where God expects me to be, where God wants me to be? Is there a way that I can chart my progress? Is there a way that I can know for sure that I'm growing spiritually, that I'm developing in a way that pleases God and in a way that will ensure that heaven will be my home. Not that we're earning our way there, but knowing that I'm pleasing God with my life here. Now, before we get into making some points and looking at how we can chart that growth, I want to make this observation. The fact that a Christian is even asking that question indicates to me that they're probably growing. If they weren't concerned, they wouldn't be growing at all. It indicates that they're not lukewarm and they're not self-righteous, that they're taking this matter seriously, and very likely they are growing. But let's take a look at some, some ways that we can, we can measure whether or not we really are growing as we should. Number one, am I changing the way that I think? Am I changing the way that I think about spiritual things? Am I changing my priorities? Has any of that changed at all since I became a Christian? Because it needs to be changing. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, we're told to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. That's, that's acceptable unto God. And a part of that is the renewing of our minds. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our minds have to be renewed. They have to be transformed. Now, if somebody has become a Christian from the world or from denominational error, then there has to be a change in the way that they think. They're going to have to relearn some things, unlearn some things. And so you would expect that, that that changing needs to be taking place. Oh, that's what the Scriptures mean here. I understand that what I believed before was error. Now I'm learning the truth. I went through that process. Or maybe someone's coming from the world. What? 
this is wrong, this is sin, I want to live a life that's pleasing unto God. And so that change needs to be taking place. For a person who was brought up in the Lord's church, which has blessings and challenges all of its own, if a person becomes a babe in Christ having been brought up in the Lord's church, there's the challenge not to conform to the world, but to make sure that our thinking is according to God's Word. Either way, there has to be a change in thinking. And this change in thinking, this transformation or renewing of the mind, I want you to understand, is a process. It's not something that happens in a moment. It's not like the day after you became a Christian, you wake up full-grown spiritually. That somehow during the night, God miraculously gave you a perfect understanding of His will, and you wake up the next day, and you're good to go from there on. And you don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to give any attention to it anymore. No, it's a process. In fact, it's a lifelong process. I enjoy the Wednesday afternoon Bible class. One of the reasons I enjoy that class is because it's made up of some of our more seasoned members, if I can say it that way. And I enjoy the input that they have. And I enjoy that that in this stage of their life, they're still wanting to learn and still wanting to grow, realizing that, that there's still something else I need to learn. It's a lifelong process. Well, what all is involved in this? Are there some specifics here? Let's take a look at a few specifics. Am I changing the way I think? Am I developing a hunger and a thirst for spiritual things? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Am I hungering after the Word of God? Have I developed that taste and that desire, that hunger for spiritual things? Am I desiring to hear and to learn God's will for my life? Or, no, I've, I've already heard that before. We've already studied that before. I already went to church once this week. Gospel meeting coming in the area, that's for that church over there. I don't have any desire to go and to study and to learn. Or... Do I have a desire? Do I have an interest in coming and hearing what God's Word has to say for my life today? That's a good indicator. Am I changing the way that I think? Am I making the hearing, the learning of God's Word a priority in my life? Am I learning and adopting God's priorities and standards in my life? In Isaiah chapter 5 and at verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now that that happens in the world. The world has the standards turned upside down. We see that all around us, but that's nothing new. That was going on in Isaiah's day. Now which am I allowing to influence me the most? Am I allowing the world to help to shape and form my priorities? Or am I allowing God to do so in His Word? Am I learning to hate the things that God hates? It's a pretty strong word, isn't it? But look in Psalm 119 and verse 104. Psalm 119 verse 104 says, Through your precepts I get understanding. The right understanding of things comes from God's Word. And so as I spend more time in God's Word learning from His precepts, I come to understand, and one of the results of that is, therefore I hate every false way. Am I learning to hate the things that God hates? Or am I learning to tolerate things that God hates? Am I allowing the world to pressure me into accepting the things that God hates? I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about things. Do I hate the things that God hates? And by contrast, am I learning to love the things that God loves? 
Now, for this, I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll, I'll speak again of our Wednesday afternoon class. We're studying 1 Peter. We recently looked at chapter 3, looked at the instruction that was given to the wives concerning their husbands. Uh, verses 3 and 4, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Am I learning to appreciate, to value, to love the things that are precious in God's sight? Am I learning? Am I changing my priorities? Here's the point. Am I learning? Am I adopting God's standards? Am I making those changes as I grow and develop as a Christian? If I'm not, then I'm not growing. So I need to be learning to see things the way God sees things. Am I developing the right attitude towards sin? What is the right attitude for a Christian to take towards sin? 1 John chapter 2 and at verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That should be our attitude towards sin. We're not going to do it. We're not going to commit sin. And so when we're tempted to sin, do we fight that temptation? Do we battle that? Do we overcome that? Or do we wave the white flag of surrender and give in? We need to take seriously the admonition of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow anyone to be tempted beyond what they are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it or to endure it. Do we take that way of escape? Do we endure temptations? James chapter 1 and at verse 12. Or do we just give in? What's our attitude towards sin? Our attitude towards sin would be a good indication of where we are spiritually. Are we overcoming temptations or are we giving in to them? Are we learning to be forgiving towards others? Here's a big challenge for some. In Colossians chapter 3, and at verse 13, as the Apostle Paul is addressing these Christians and talking about things that they need to put on that will help them to get along with each other, to be one with each other, he says in verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Are you learning how to forgive others? Are you learning how to forgive yourself? Or are you still challenged with that? Look in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Now I realize we're hitting these verses and we're moving very quickly. That's the nature of this type of a sermon. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Jesus says, Take heed to yourself. When we read that in Scripture, especially coming from our Lord's own mouth, that needs to be like red lights going off. That's a warning. That's a danger sign. Take this seriously. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. What is it I need to take heed to? You need to be careful that you don't have an unforgiving attitude towards your brother but you don't understand what he's done. We don't talk here about what he's done. We talk about what he does. He repents. That means you forgive him. Verse 4, And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. I don't know about that. That's a pretty tall order. And that tells me where you are on that growth chart. You've got a ways to go. Are we learning how to forgive our brother? Are we learning how to forgive others? That's a good indication. Are we seeking instruction from God's Word? Are we allowing it to change the way that we think? Change the way that we react? Change the way that we live in our lives? If so, we're growing. 
or grow. Here's another way. Let's move and let's look at another area. What is your relationship with God like? How would you describe your relationship with God? Are you developing a closer personal relationship with God? Let's put it this way. Since this time last year, have you grown closer to God? Have you gotten to know God a little bit better? Have you come to rely upon God a little bit more? Or maybe you're just where you were. Maybe you've distanced yourself from God a little bit. Think about that. James says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. As we studied in the previous hour about the prodigal son, we see that the father is always watching and is more than willing to go and to meet us as we come to Him. Are you coming to Him? Are you drawing near to God? Let me ask this question. Are you learning to live in God's presence? Are you learning to live your life day by day as if God is right there with you? Or do you honestly have this view that you meet God here every Sunday and Wednesday? And then when the amen is said, you leave him here and you go and live your life. Think about that. Yes, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere all the time. But do you live your life as you, have you learned to live your life as if God is right there with you? He's riding in the seat next to you as you're commuting to work. He's got your back as you're getting things out of your locker at school. He's right there with you in the cubicle at work. He's standing next to you as you're standing and preaching or teaching a Bible class. Have you learned to live in God's presence? Are you drawing close to God? What's your prayer life like? Your prayer life is a great indication of your overall spiritual life. How would you describe your prayer life? Is it sporadic? Do you pray three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or do you spend time each day in prayer unto God? Do you continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it? Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Do you pray without ceasing? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Or again, are, are your prayers hit and miss? Are you making time to pray unto God? I'm always challenged when I start reading the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, very early in our Lord's ministry, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, He went out and departed to a solitary place, and there He prayed. He made time to be alone with his Father in prayer. Do I do that? Do you do that? When you pray to God, do you rattle off the same lines that you always use when you pray unto God? Check them all off as you go. In Jesus' name, amen. Or do you talk to God? Do you go into your inner room and shut the door, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, and pour out your heart to God in prayer? I don't need to do that. God already knows everything. Yes, He does. But God also says, I want to hear it from you. To adapt, 1 Peter chapter 5 and at verse 7, cast your cares upon me. I want to hear what's troubling you today. I want to hear what's exciting you today. I want to hear what's frustrating you today. I want to hear who it is that you are thinking about today. What's your relationship with God like? What's your prayer life like? How about worship? Is worship meaningful to you? Or again, are we just going through the motions? 
We're here because we're expected to be here. A good article in the bulletin this week, Why Are You Here? Take the time to read that later, not now. Take the time to read that. Why are, why are you here? Do you look forward to assembling with the saints so that you can connect with God in a more meaningful way, so that you can join others in offering your genuine praise and thanksgiving unto God? Do you worship God during the week on your own, privately? Now, I don't mean do you have time set aside in which you you go and you go through the five acts of worship on your own. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, when you see a beautiful sunset, do you worship God? Do you praise Him right then and right there for the majesty and the beauty of His creation? When you see a newborn child, a newborn baby, you worship God and praise Him for what He has made and what He has done. When you hear good news from someone, or maybe good news from a news source, you worship God and praise Him. What's your attitude towards worship? I believe that helps to answer this question. Are you drawing closer to to God or not? It's something you need to answer for yourself, but it's going to go a long way in helping you to understand whether or not you're growing as a Christian or not. Let's take a look at yet another area. Am I bearing fruit for the Lord? This is where we catch up with the reading that we had before the sermon in John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. You must abide in me if, if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be removed from me. You're going to be cast out. You're going to be burned. The Lord is going to prune the vine. But if you stay connected with me, what, what's going to happen? You're going to bear fruit. But there's an expression the Lord uses twice. In verse 5 and again in verse 8, not only do we bear fruit, we bear much fruit. Are you bearing much fruit for the Lord? And we'll dig into that in just a moment. But the imperative is that you and I as Christians, we're not pew setters. No, we bear fruit. We're to be productive. We are created to walk in good works, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says. Scripture thoroughly equips us for every good work, 2 Timothy 3 verse 17 says. But it's Colossians 1 verse 10 that says that we are to be fruitful in every good work. What are some of these good works in which we are to be fruitful? Let's talk about attendance. Let's talk about our attendance in the local church. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And I would ask, are you establishing a consistent track record with your attendance? at the local church. Are you one of those members that if you're not here, everyone wonders why? Where can you be? What's wrong? Or are you one of those members that when you're not here, members honestly say, I guess this is one of the weeks they're not attending. Are you establishing a track record? Are you making yourself a part of the local church? Not just, I want the elders to to recognize me as a member, and I want my name and my address to be in the directory, and I'll see you when I can. Are you putting forth the effort to make yourself, make your family a part of the local church here? It was announced a few weeks ago that A young family here decided to leave this congregation to go to another congregation. The reason that was given is because they didn't feel like they were at home here. That baffles me. How could someone come to Knollwood and not feel at home? Unless it's your practice to show up whenever you want to show up, and as soon as the last amen is said, to beat it out the door as fast as you can go, then yeah, you're not going to feel like you belong because you're not allowing anyone to welcome you 
can make you feel welcome. So how about you? When, when you do assemble together, are you coming in the spirit of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Are you considering others? Are you exhorting others? Do you come to stir up, not stir up trouble, but to stir up love and good works? Well, that's fruit. Your being here is fruit. How about your contribution? How about your contribution? Are you giving like you should? I think our contribution here at Knollwood is taking care of itself. As a congregation, I think we're doing well. But I don't know what you're doing as an individual. You know that. Are you giving your best? Are you giving as you prosper? Are you giving as you purpose in your heart? Maybe you need to think about that. But not just your money. Are you giving your time? Are you giving your talents? I think it's rather sad that we had one of our classes canceled because of lack of people step forward to teach the class. Are we contributing our time and our talents to the betterment of God's will and God's kingdom and the work of this church? That's a good indication. If we're growing or not, are we bearing that fruit? Are we actively serving others here? A couple of verses in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul is writing to these churches. False teachers have come in. Judaizing teachers have come in, have introduced false doctrine. Anytime false doctrine is introduced to a church, there's going to be a division. There's going to be problems there, and it can result in brethren fighting against each other. So Paul's addressing that here. Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then down in chapter 6, verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. What are some good things that we can be doing to serve one another? Are we praying for one another? Are we helping one another? Are we bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ? Are we being hospitable to one another without grumbling? There's another one for our Wednesday afternoon class. 1 Peter chapter 4 and at verse 8 there. Are you volunteering to help members with their housework as they are getting back on their feet? You know, someone who needs some auto work done, some mechanic work done, some help repairing around their house. Are you taking food to those who are sick? Are you giving rides to those who need rides to appointments? Are you sitting and talking with those who are continuing to mourn and to adjust the loss of their loved one? Are we bearing one another's burdens? Do we have a servant's heart? Are we bearing that fruit? in helping to serve one another? Are we leading others to Christ? In John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, we have Andrew, who would later become an apostle. He meets Jesus. The first thing he does is he goes and he gets his brother, Simon, and brings him to Jesus. You know, the times that we read of Andrew, just by himself, In the gospel accounts, when we read of Andrew, almost every time, Andrew is bringing someone to Jesus. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, it's Andrew who has brought the lad with the loaves and the fishes. In John chapter 12, it's Andrew who has brought the Gentiles who say, we wish to see Jesus. Now, when we start talking about the apostles, Andrew usually doesn't make the top billing. But the man knew how to bring people to Jesus. Jesus, let's go and do likewise. Are we being like Andrew? Someone might say, well, you know, uh, God is the one who gives the increase. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and at verse 6, it is God who gives the increase. 
But I think God needs a few more of us doing some planting and watering. Because Paul says, I planted Apollos water. God gives the increase. Are we doing the planting and the watering like we should? There are opportunities all around us. I know the state of the world that we're living in. It's a state that Jesus would say is ripe for the harvest. There are souls that are looking. Are we looking for them? There's no better fruit that we can bear to God's glory than to bring someone to Christ. We talked again. We talked this morning in Bible class about how valuable a soul is. Are we looking for those souls? Are we bearing fruit for the Lord? Are we bearing much fruit for the Lord? Think about that. As you think about whether or not you're growing and maturing as a Christian, what kind of fruit are you producing for the Lord? Then I want to look at one final thing, but I want your attention as we look at this last point. It may be that you've been sitting through this sermon so far, and you've been hearing about spiritual growth, and you've been hearing about giving time to learning more about God's Word, and time spent in prayer, and time doing and serving others, and time drawing closer unto God, and changing the way that you're thinking. And you say, preacher, that that all sounds great, and I'd love to be able to do that someday, but you don't understand what's going on in my life right now. I'm facing a trial in my life right now. I'm facing a a sorrow in my life right now. My world is turned upside down right now. And I'll get to that whenever I can, but right now, I, I really today, I needed to hear a sermon that can help me to get through a trial. Because that's what's going on right now. What I want you to understand is that handling trials in the right way is an opportunity for growth. The way you handle a trial in your life, the way you handle a storm, the way you handle that devastating news, it's going to determine how you grow. If we're striving to serve the Lord, if we're really wanting to grow, We're going to suffer persecution. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How are we going to handle that? James tells us how to handle that. He tells us to handle that with our faith. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You're going through a trial right now. Your faith is being tested. You're given an opportunity to grow. If hardships are handled with the right attitude, it's always going to result in the growth of your faith and in the development of your character. But I suggest that you need to learn to see the hardships that happen in your life the way David did, as we studied this morning in our 9.30 hour. By the way, if you came today expecting a Thanksgiving sermon, we had that. We had that at 9.30. Wish you'd been here. But we learned there, as we looked at Psalm 30, that David was able to see that the hardships in his life were actually times in which God disciplined him and helped to refine his character and helped him to rid himself of some ungodly attitudes that he may have had in his life. Have you learned to view hardships in that way? Hebrews chapter 12, we won't take the time to read the entire text, but starting at verse 5, going down through verse 11, We're admonished to view the hardships that we face as God's discipline. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Yes, you may be enduring some trials right now. You know what that tells me? 
If you are enduring them, surviving them, you're growing. You're growing spiritually. So don't say this spiritual growth is something I'm going to get to as soon as my life clears up, as, as soon as things get better in my life. We know that's not the way things work. And if that's what it's going to take to keep you from growing spiritually, Satan's going to make sure you always have that excuse. No, view that as an opportunity for you to refine your faith, to strengthen your trust on God, and to grow spiritually. Now, brethren and friends, there are many other things that we could include in a list like this. Maybe I haven't talked about something that is very important to you, or something that you cherish very much. Share that with me. I'd like to hear that. But, but these are some areas that I believe we can look at and that will help us to answer that question, am I really growing spiritually? Now, let me... Let me make this statement, and the sermon will be yours. It is a dangerous thing for you and I to say that we're growing when we're not. Oh, I'm growing. I'm doing fine. It's a nice sermon, preacher, but I didn't really need that. Everything's going just fine with me when the reality is we're we're still babes in Christ. Or we're like the church in in Laodicea, we're lukewarm, or we're like the church in Sardis, we're dead. It's a dangerous thing for us to assume that we're growing when we're really not. But it's a harmful thing for us to say that we're not growing when we really are. For us to use a sermon like this as an opportunity to beat ourselves up, Oh, if I was the Christian that I ought to be, then then I would be much further than I am today, and and woe is me, and I'm not growing like I should be. If you're growing, you're growing. You're growing. So it's a harmful thing for us to say that we're not growing when we really are. What we need to do is we need to pray unto God to give us the wisdom to be able to see ourselves as He really sees us. Are we growing like we should be? Is He pleased? Would He say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or are there some areas in our lives that we need to improve? Is there an area of our life that we're we're not even giving any attention to at all that we need to be looking at? Think back over the things we've studied today. We need to pray that God would give us the wisdom to see where we truly stand spiritually and to make those changes that we need to make in our life. I thank you so much for your kind attention as we've studied this, as we looked at this question. I hope that we've all been here before at some time in our life. Am I growing? Am I doing what God would have me to do? We don't have to wonder about that. We can go to God's Word and find the answers to those questions. But let's be honest as we make that application to our lives today. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. And I don't care how old you are physically, you need to be born again. You need to become a child of God. By repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being baptized in water to have those sins washed away, the baptistry is ready. Everything's ready if you're ready to become a Christian today. Maybe you've done that in the past, but the study today has helped you to realize that you've let God down and you need to serve Him more faithfully. Then make those corrections. Do that on your own. But if you need to take care of it publicly or you're overwhelmed and you'd like for for us to pray for you, whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing? this invitation song.